that's uh, happened with these, this colloquium is that uh, it features, you know, many of the speakers sort of have this, um, um, have this, um, uh, uh, you know, theme of bridging between between physics and computer science, and Jens is a great example of this. So he's uh, he's a condensed matter theorist, but his work has been really, um, you know, um, in a lot of his work, uh, which I really appreciate, has been bridging between uh, concepts from computer science and physics and uh, condensed matter physics. Uh, so he's done done work on area laws and. Uh, um, you know the complexity of uh, of uh, ground and low energy states. He's he's uh, he's worked on uh, verification of quantumness, and uh, in this talk, which is uh, seems very exciting, he's he's going to talk about actual quantum circuit complexity and how to how to get at it through pretty novel uh, novel uh, tools. So Jens, looking forward to your your colloquium. Yeah, that's great. Um, thanks so much indeed. You're too kind. Thanks to Umesh for this um, kind invitation to this wonderful um, seminar series on bridging the fields, as you say, between uh, physics and um, computer science. I would have loved to be there in flesh and blood and person, but now it's great to be here, at least um, virtually. So in this talk, as Umesh has said, we will be concerned with quantum circuit complexity, or rather the linear growth thereof. Now with complexity, of course, we are very much at home here at Simons. And even though the, the flavor we have, we have in mind is not, not, not quite that of computational complexity, it's surely very much um, related. And before I get started, I should give ample credit to these wonderful people here. I had, I've had the pleasure to work with this on this work. And I think at least one of these people or two of them actually should be also in the in the panel um, later today or later this evening on, on, on my side. So in a way, um, we will go on a journey um, when we meander through the theme that is somewhere, well, bridging gaps. It's kind of somewhere located at the intersection of high energy physics, holography, and the wormhole growth paradox. Um, then uh, quantum computing and statistical physics and thermodynamics in, in, in one way or the other, even though it's kind of probably fair to say that we are sitting somewhere um, here in this talk. So we will be mostly inspired by ideas of quantum computing and quantum information methods and hint um, to the other aspects um, mentioned. Now there will be two concepts that will guide us through this um, talk. These are notions of circuit and state complexity. Now on the highest level, complexity can be seen as a, as a tool, as a means to make sense of the enormity of Hilbert space in quantum mechanics. Now, Hilbert space is big, it's, it's huge, and notions of complexity can be seen as a, as a guide um, in, 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 in this game. So one often reads statements about quantum computers operating in exponentially large Hilbert spaces, and this being the origin of the computational speed up over classical computers. And while this is not entirely wrong in a way, one has to appreciate that the set of states that can be prepared efficiently on a quantum computer is an exponentially small subset of Hilbert space. So there have been works on the convenient illusion of Hilbert space, and, and there's a point to it as one, one cannot access the entire vector space efficiently, of course, we can think of an, of an onion picture of like more and more complex states we can reach with the, with the least complex states um, sitting there in the center of the onion. Good, but maybe it's a good moment to, to become a little bit um, more concrete. So in classical computing, <laughs> I don't need to, to teach you. So the, the circuit complexity of, of a computation captures the, the number of elementary steps that's minimally um, needed to determine um, an outcome. So the, the complexity of a Boolean function would be the, the minimum number of basic of elementary steps that's needed to evaluate the function. So the, the, the precise fine print will depend on the on the model chosen, sure, but this notion of complexity provides a, a useful way to, to quantify the hardness of a computational problem because the, the, the number of steps um, scales with the, with the size of the input. So the problem 
has, has a rather weak dependence on, on the specific choice um, of, the, of the model. And then um, the computational task can be considered uh, feasible or, or easy if its complexity grows no faster than a, a the power of the input size and would be intractable otherwise, as one says, or and computationally hard. So the, the complexity separates computational tasks into easy and hard ones. So a reading of the famous church turing thesis states that all reasonable models of computation give rise to the same class of easy problems that are computable in polynomial time, a statement that presumably also applies to natural processes that are occurring in, in, in nature. Now, alas, of course, ultimately, the world is quantum. Um, and similar notions of quantum circuit complexities take over immediately from the classical to the quantum world. They are motivated in pretty much precisely the same fashion. But there's also some physics -y points um, coming in. Um, say when thinking of like quantum phases of matter, where one would like allow constant quantum circuits when going from one point in a phase to another while keeping the, the Hamiltonian gap, gap open. So here's the key definition that's in the center of all this. So this is the circuit complexity as the least number of two qubit gates from a given gate set that is needed to represent a given unitary. So we have a given unitary, we want to decompose it in terms of um, gates. How many of them do we need? Here in the um, traditional exact setting, and I will say something about the approximate setting um, later. And the state complexity can be seen as the immediate state analog as the least number of two qubit gates to create a given pure state from a fiducial. Um, quantum state, say the, the all zero state. So this definition makes a lot of sense. It's very natural, it's, um, it's very meaningful and, and, and so on. It also helps to, um, to, to, to capture things. Alas, it's notoriously hard to, to, to compute. And that's not a surprise. Um, so clearly uh, we could be doing something with a quantum circuit and prepare states, but maybe we should like undo things in later steps to then have a state that allows us to, to better prepare another state. There's all kinds of dependencies. So um, it, it, it's, it's no surprise that this is um, a, a, a computationally um, hard problem. So maybe a, a, a more quantitative way of, 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 of putting this related to a kind of related but not identical problem is that the the runtime of the best known algorithm for T count that decides whether the optimal gate decomposition of a quantum circuit that is given as a sequence of Clifford from the Clifford group that are often seen as kind of relatively easily implementable that can be done transversely on the, on the surface code and so on. And T gates, which are the, the precious, expensive, um, extra resource that you need on n qubits involves fewer than or equal to empty gates or more is um, has a kind of uh, uh, a, a runtime that scales exponential in the in, in the in the system size. And um, similar questions are related to circuit lower bounds. So it's a, not very surprising that's a computationally hard task to um, identify the circuit complexity. That's that again. It's like very meaningful and in, in many ways so we can see like the circuit or state complexity as a as a tool to kind of organize unitaries and quantum states and in kind of diagrams that kind of label states and, and in unitaries according to their complexity say on on, on the left side on, on on the state level would be like product states that can be prepared with um unit depth quantum circuits there is like matrix product state that can be prepared with um, staircase circuits of depth N, GZ states also of this type. There's um, multi-scale renormalization that would be uh, N log N um, complexity and, and, and so on. On the unitary side, we can think of 
like circuits for classical shadows, which are on the, on the shallow side. There is variation quantum circuits for quantum approximate optimization. Unitary K designs we come to later. Polynomial random circuits that Nick has worked so much on. And on the, on, on the right hand side, we would have, have like high random circuits that are really costly to, to spell out and approximate well in terms of, um, of quantum circuits. So again, circuit and state complexity is very natural and meaningful and make a lot of sense. They catalog states and so on. They, they relate to notions of computation complexity, but they are notoriously hard to compute. They are kind of um, the, the, the best known, the runtime of the best known algorithms would scale exponentially in the system size. So it's when you kind of want to think of how um, complexity scales, say for a family of circuits, it's, it seems completely inconceivable even for a small number of qubits to make a plot or something, how the, the complexity would scale, say for a, a meaningful um, instance of, of, a, of a, or a meaningful family of, of, of quantum circuits. I mean, even for a tiny number of qubits is completely out of scope to see what scaling would, would have in, in, in the complexity in this sense. Alas, this is precisely what we will do in the next part of, of, of this talk. When we have a look at how the complexity grows for so-called random quantum circuits. Now, Random quantum circuits are, of course, ubiquitous in quantum information. They are everywhere in so many forms and, and, and flavors. Most prominently, maybe, they feature strongly in the recent efforts, also motivated by work by Scott, on like, quantum advantages of having like some like, random circuit implemented, followed by measurements. And there's some um, strong arguments that one cannot sample classically efficiently from a distribution that's nearby the output distribution of such a random quantum circuit, followed by by, by measurements, but they also feature in, in, in many other settings. What's most important here is maybe the idea that they can be largely seen as proxies for, for the real thing, for quantum chaotic dynamics generated by time-dependent or time-independent um, complex quantum chaotic Hamiltonians, say from the condensed matter or high energy realm and why it's not quite the same thing. And there, many of the results carry over and people have looked at, say, localization properties or properties of time, um, out of time ordered correlation functions for random circuits that very much mimic the real thing of the Hamiltonian dynamics, which goes as far as um, some people like almost using random circuits as almost the same thing as the, the true Hamiltonian dynamics in a way, but it can be studied in a in an easier and more natural um, um, uh, uh, fashion. So in what follows, we will largely see these random circuits as like toy proxies of, of intricate, complex, um, chaotic dynamics. So there's many, um, hi Scott, there's many like forms and flavors once again. So. Um, prominent in this talk will be the brick layer circuits of the layouts um, here, but we can also think of lots of other um, structures of say um, staircase circuits where in one run you would create a so-called matrix product state out of that, an MPS, a, a many paper state, but if you do many runs of this staircase, you would get like some like certain flavor of a random circuit. If you pick how random state, how random circuits and uh, how random gates and, and place them. But you can also think of a random random circuit where you pick a random layout and um, you pick how random quantum gates that you place according to this random layout. Our argument is strong enough to capture any of these, of these settings. So the way we kind of make sense of a circuit depth would be that we put these circuits in chunks so that they would um, include a backward um, causal cone and these guys would be called causal slice that's not so important so we would kind of um, count the depth of the circuit by the number of um, causal slices we would put um, next to each other and think of the of the setting as um, being like a brick layer circuit where we pick um, ha random two qubit gates, place them there, and then we look at the family of circuits that we get by having deeper and deeper circuits of this of this kind. So,
So how does the complexity grow? So how does the complexity grow as a function of the depth of the circuit? If you make this deeper and deeper, what happens to the circuit complexity in a way we've just um, defined? It? Now, <clears throat> of course, <laughs> every circuit is its own description. So the heart of the matter is like how much we can compress the circuit and whether there's some sort of redundancy um, in the circuit, there could be a, a significantly shorter description of the same unitary that is generated by the random circuit at hand. So the heart of the matter is if you make the circuit deeper and deeper, how would the circuit complexity defined in the way a minute ago would grow with the size of, of, of the circuit? Now, this question has moved quite a bit into prominence, into visibility in, 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 in the quantum information realm and also in the high energy realm, mostly um, because of a, of a kind of a, a, a context that was made popular by these gentlemen here, by Brown and Suskin, in particular, the, the, the right um, person shown here, that's a very prominent figure, one of the co-inventors of, 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 of string theory, who's kind of um, toured the world with the question of the complexity growth in the holographic context, and specifically the complexity growth of thermal field quantum doubles, where he um, gives like very uh, uh, like flamboyant and inspiring talks on that matter. John Preskill is, 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 is quoted to saying that um, whatever it is, uh, Lenny Suskin has the beautiful ability to um, very nicely explain what, what it's about. So um, uh, the, 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 the context that um, Lenny has um, put this question in is that of the complexity growth of thermal field doubles. These are quantum states with the property that the reduction to every part would be um, Gibbs states, would be thermal states. And um, in the setting of holography that relates to different physical theories, namely that of um, Einstein gravity in antithesis space and quantum um, field theory sitting on the, on, on the boundary. So this context of holography thermal field doubles are seen as being dual to eternal black holes in this um, like negatively curved antithesis space. And, the, the, the black hole's geometry consists of, of two sides that are connected by a, by a wormhole, so an Einstein um, Rosen bridge. And the, the Einstein's the, the, the wormhole's volume is, is thought to grow for a time that's exponential in the number of degrees of freedom in the, in the boundary theory. And as, as we just said, the, the, the random quantum circuits are expected to be like a proxy to capture the presumed Hamiltonian actual dynamics behind the horizon. So, and if that's the case, if they do, the, the growth of the wormhole's volume is, is conjectured to, to match the, the growth of the boundary state's complexity. So that what's the, the volume growth on the, on, the, on the gravity side would be the, the complexity growth on the, on, the, on, the, on, on the quantum side. So both would be expected to reach a value that's exponentially large in the number of degrees of freedom, but at a, at, at a very long, long, long time. And this is kind of where this idea came from that the, the, the complexity should grow. It's not, it's like that's the, the, the right quantum property that we should look at. The complexity should grow um, linearly in time until, until a, a long time. So the specific statement is that one would um, expect, and that's kind of this brown Suskin conjecture, that the, one would expect a linear growth um, of the depth of the circuit until a time that's exponential in the depth of the circuit. And um, if we think about that, this is not such an unnatural behavior. It's actually pretty, it's pretty natural if, 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 out of the matter. So, um, so think of the random circuit as a, as a, as a random walk in, a, in, 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 in Hilbert space. And Hilbert space is big. So, so how, how unlucky can you be that you would kind of go back in this, in, in this random circuit? You will always kind of conquer new territory along the way. So only at a time when you basically sampled out this entire Hilbert space, you will kind of get, get back and would get cancellations along the way. And then the kind of complexity would kind of saturate to a, a, a constant, constant value. So the, the upshot is that there will be few cancellations. And for, for most of the time, until very late times when, when kind of cancellations would, would kind of set in. So again, this would mean that cancellations actually hardly matter. They, you know, and, and it's kind of natural to expect this kind of linear growth behavior. So yes, that's 
very natural. And there's also a nice back of the envelope calculation that um, Lenny has done. Um, but, um, but how would one judge? I mean, there will be cancellations. So it's, um, it's not that there's not a shorter descriptions possibly. So there will be cancellations, there will be um, shorter quantum circuits, but we just expect this to be not dominant for most of most circuits uh, and so on. So there's no way we can compute this property. It's not, it's a computationally hard problem. So how can we ever see the complexity growing as a function of the depth of the circuit if we can't compute this quantity? And if there will be cancellations, there will be something, but what, what, what can we do? So how can the growth be, be, be judged? So um, uh, 20 minutes into the talk, I will, I will keep it also rather short and, and, and long to have a bit of time for discussion. So I will not go too much into detail, but I will kind of on a high level um, say a few things on, on how this argument goes. So as I mentioned, complexity is too much of a beast. I refer to the T count problem as a, um, as a computational problem. So let's um, maybe stay away from the complexity for a while and rather think in terms of a dimension of a kind that's slightly easier to, 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 to capture. And the, and the starting point of this um, framework that we've been thinking about is the notion of a contraction map level that sounds rather rather fanciful, but it, what it is, it's just to, it's the map from our quantum gates, um, two qubit quantum gates into the unitary group of N qubits, which just reflects how we place the quantum gates in a given architecture. So we, in one way or the other, will place these quantum gates in our architecture, and that will be the choice of the unitary gates and the, the parts of the gates, and they, they will realize some unitary in this large dimensional, um, uh, like sub, in, in this, um, as, a, as, a, as a subset in this large um, group. And there will be a reachable set, which would be the, the unitaries we can reach by changing the parameters of the unitaries. It's actually a very strange set. It's hard to capture, it's not a manifold. It's very fingery and funny. It's a set. And that will have a dimension and that we call the accessible dimension of the set. Now, what is important is that this image, U of A, the set is not a manifold. Um, but it's what is called a semi-algebraic set. What is this? So an algebraic set is a set of real vectors which are constrained by polynomial equalities. And a semi-algebraic set is one that's constrained, is a, is a collection of real vectors that's constrained by a set of um, equalities and inequality constraints. For example, uh, take the, the unit circle in two dimensions, that's not a manifold, but the open disk is a manifold of dimension two and the unit circle is a manifold of dimension one. And this kind of dimension would be the, the largest dimension in a, of a foliation in terms of, 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 of manifold. So two would be the dimension of, of, of this set. Now much of the heavy lifting comes from a principle um, that's uh, actually pretty cool. <laughs> it's the, it's the tasky seidenberg principle that says that the image of an arbitrary semi-algebraic set under a polynomial function is another semi-algebraic set. Now, where does this come in? But the point is, it shows that our set U of A, the, 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 the unitaries at the end of the day, are a semi-algebraic set because in one way or the other are the, the, is the placement given by some polynomial function and the knobs at the, at the beginning are uh, constrained by a, a semi-algebraic set. So that means that by, by virtue of this, this principle, the, the U of A is a semi-algebraic set. Now, um, the next step is the, the rank of this contraction map that's important in a point. Now that's the rank of a matrix that approximates this contraction map linearly around a certain point. Now, the next step 
is to prove that this contraction map has the same rank throughout the domain, except from a few funny points. So except from a measure zero z um, in, in all possible, in all, all possible, all, all possible points. So here's a fanciful way of, of saying that that's the low rank locus. So the, the low rank locus, so the, 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 um, the set of points of non-maximum rank is an algebraic set of measure zero and it's closed in the D algebraic topology. So equivalently, the, the, the set of points um, with maximum rank is an open set of measure one. And this DA that we are looking for, this, this rank has the maximum rank. So that sounds a bit fanciful. So why would that be interesting? Well, it's, it's, it's very interesting because it, it puts things upside down. It, it, it helps us so, so that we don't have to kind of optimize over all circuits, which we couldn't do in polynomial time anyway, um, or, or sort of like optimize things. So, but we rather say that in a way, um, almost all circuits would have like this maximum rank and we only have to find a sufficiently generic family of, of, of random circuits that would have this kind of linear growth of, 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 of complexity. So it's kind of changing the, the, the quantifiers of, of, of the problem in a, in a way. So we have to identify an, an X where R grows linearly, this, 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 um, this, this rank grows linearly with R, like with the number of chunks in the circuits or with a circuit depth, if, if you want. And um, what could be more natural than picking a Clifford circuit or a family of random Clifford circuits. Yeah, so we, we have to just demonstrate the point's existence and not optimize over all settings. And we demonstrate this point's existence by perturbing um, random Clifford circuits. And we do so by, by appending small, like infinitesimal unitaries and kind of count the, the independent directions we can go into. Now, this is actually this is the most tedious part of the of the proof in, in, in terms of length. So we basically ex take a, a, a like Pauli basis and expand these unitaries. And this being a Clifford circuit, and we know that the, um, the normalizer of the Pauli group is the um, are, are the Clifford circuit. So we can basically uh, conjugate the, the the Paulis to the very end. We can push them to the end and, and see how the the Paulis are being changed by pushing them through. So we can see. We can uh, count the independent directions by by looking at the at the setting of, of, of Pauli at the at the very end, and then we can indeed make it a counting argument by by counting these independent directions and see how this um, R grows linearly, uh, how the R grows with with uh, um, depth of the circuit, and this indeed grows linearly with the system size. Um, so the the Clifford circuits do the job. So we get a lower bound of this accessible dimension. So if A denotes the architecture with R being TL gates, so L is the number of, of gates in the chunk and T is the, is the number of them. So we assume this architecture consists of coarse slices of L gates each. Then the architecture's accessible dimension is lower bounded by a quantity that goes like um, uh, R over L. So scales linearly with R, which is what, what we want to, want to, want to see. Um, good, and, and, and the rest is elaborate count. So it's kind of interesting that this is a, is a, is a, is a rigorous argument, it's a rigorous proof, um, but it in a way it still picks up the idea of a counting argument by Lenny, but in, in, a, in an upside down way that in the very end, it's, it's a basic elaborate counting argument that we, that we can put together. So in the end, one, one sees that if there was a, a, a circuit R prime that is much shorter, would have like a much um, 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 uh, would have a much smaller complexity than R, then we would kind of get into a contradiction with the earlier statement that most points would have this um, this uh, same um, rank and, and, and dimension. So almost every U has a complexity greater than this greatest possible R prime, and then um, one can. Uh, finish this argument by contradiction to see that indeed the complexity will grow linearly with um, the size of the circuit. I should say that there was a nice simplification of argument of this of, of our last step of this argument by a paper by, by Lee that came out earlier 
this year, which is kind of a, a, a beautiful refinement of our last step concerning the, the Clifford circuit. So this is kind of nice to see that there's a bit of a shortcut at, at, at the very end. But otherwise, the logic of the argument is, is very similar. So that gives us the desired wanted argument. There is a linear growth of complexity. So if you is a unitary that's implemented by a random quantum circuit in an architecture that's formed by T, which is like R over L causes slides of L gates each. These are the chunks. Then the unitary circuit complexity is lower bounded by this quantity here that has is linear in R. It grows linearly in the depth with a constant that's not asymptotic, not important. And so it will grow linearly with the complexity. It's not a counting argument. It's not a, not a back of the envelope calculation, but it's a, it's a rigorous argument with unit probability over the realizations of the random circuit until the number of gates grows to this number here, which is exponential in the system size, which is the point that when the, the complexity flattens and we expect this saturation to happen. The same bout holds for the state complexity again until a time or a depth, if you want, that is exponential in the system size. So there is a linear growth of the complexity. There's an interesting dependence, I should say, on, um, on L, uh, which is like one over L, which is kind of interesting, which is the, the, the depth of the circuit. But again, for every depth, we will get a linear growth of the complexity as a function of the circuit. So this is what we see. We do see the, the linear growth. This is kind of the brown suskin conjecture, which we have settled for the exact circuit complexity. So there is a linear complexity growth. Very nice. Um, good. <laughs> 30 minutes into the talk. Um, let's have a bit of an interlude and um, think a bit about approximate notions, connections to entanglement, to unitary designs, and have a bit of a snippet of a second part, but I keep it rather short, than, shorter than too long. Um, so uh, we will be a bit sketchier from, from here. So this is nice. We were like very happy with this result. So that can be seen as a fair resolution of this problem, Susskind conjecture. Um, so it, it, we do show the linear growth, in, in, under pretty general conditions in a rigorous fashion with kind of these uh, um, tools of semi-algebraic geometry, which is a fresh tool in this context, which is a nice and a pretty powerful um, kind of tool to, to, to work with. Now, what else would we want? Maybe the most pressing thing that I, I would like to see or that we would like to see is like how approximate notions can be, can be realized because after all, this is a, well defined by the very stringent notion of complexity. So we would equally well think of a, of an, a notion of complexity that for given unitary would not want to um, like realize the unitary exactly, but only approximately to a constant error in the, in the operator norm, which would make, make, make perfect sense. And while some of the arguments that we have carry over to some approximate settings there, the tools are not quite powerful enough as we have them to give to, to give strong results in, in, in the sense that we can really give a kind of constant error in the, in, the, in the operator norm, which is really what we want to see here. So that's really something that we, we are thinking about quite, quite, quite hard these days. There's something one can say about in, in a very baby sense and, and also making a connection to the Nielsen cost and, and entanglement. So I mean, this, in this context, people like to think a lot about this kind of Nielsen cost um, when they think about notions of complexity, which is basically the idea to develop a geometric picture of circuit complexity and pick a, a set of operators, say an operator basis or, or, or something, and see the circuit as a time ordered integral over these operators with a certain way that's being switched on and off in a time dependent fashion where the cost will be just some integral over a norm over these, these weights say the L1 norm is the, is the most common choice in, 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 in this sense. So entanglement is not complexity. As we know, there's a beautiful paper by Lenny about this, but actually for very small values of, of complexity is. So there's a lower bound of the complexity in terms of entanglement that relates also to beautiful work by one of our panelists that um, I might mention later. There's also the interesting um, consequence of that, that there's probability distributions 
that require a complexity of the order n squared if you realize them as a circuit followed by measurements. I don't know what to do with this, but there's a connection between complexity and entanglement in a meaningful um, way. Also, there's a connection to unitary design. So a generation of unitary T designs at a depth of the order NT would imply the approximate brown suskin conjecture, which is great. But then how would we implement a, a unitary design of this, of this type? So how can unitary designs be implemented in the first place? So well, that's a bit of a procrastination. Admittedly, I, 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 I admit it freely. Um, Nick is a, one of the leaders in the field of thinking about how to generate unitary designs from random quantum circuits. And I've been thinking about that quite a bit over the years as well. To remind you, a unitary design is a collection of unitaries, a finite collection of unitaries that mimics the Haar measure so that you get a T design if the average over these finite unitaries is exactly matching the um, averages of, over the Haar measure up to moments of order T. And there's also meaningful approximate notions um, there. And random circuits of the type that we're discussing throughout the talk until now would give rise to unitary designs in the sense, although not quite to that accuracy for suitably um, short circuits. Now, um, random Clifford circuits, as we've seen a minute ago, they give rise to designs that's well known. They're not quite four designs. They gracefully fail to be four designs as one says, but they are three designs, the exact three designs. And um, they can be uplifted to arbitrary order designs to, by adding T gates along the way of the type that we also mentioned earlier. So say you have like 10,000 qubits, I wish, but never mind. And you want to get a 29 order design. So if a Clifford circuit, you ask how many T gates do you need to add to uplift this order three design to a 29 order design? And we worked hard on this. And the answer, it's actually a, a representation theory where they change our massacre. Um, but the answer is, is actually quite striking, which is you add, say, five or so T gates, a number that is constant in the system size. So a constant number of T gates is sufficient to uplift a random Clifford circuit to an arbitrary order design independent of N, independent of the system size. That's really weird. It's like a, this kind of uh, spread of universality, this t gateness that sits there and it kind of spreads all over the place and gets amplified and goes over the entire system and lifting up order three designs to arbitrary order designs independent of it. Kind of funny. I, I found that uh, pretty funny. Um, so this is a very technical paper. Um, this will come out any day or maybe it has come out today in, in the communications of mathematical physics. Um, that has a very serious title. It's a German journal. You, you better, you're better serious. We couldn't <laughs> refrain from ourselves from uh, calling the paper on the preprint server quantum homo homeopathy works because the good medicine of the T gates can be amplified arbitrarily many times, and you still get the the T design out as a as a as a treatment. Never mind. Um, find it funny or not? <laughs> we got lots of <laughs> funny emails. That's for sure. Afterwards, um, but this kind of technical paper will come out in, in, in a minute. So um, that's this. So unitary designs. If you could work, if you had better unitary designs, we could also approach approach the Brown Suskin question in, in a fresh way. We should work harder on this. Thirty-seven minutes. Um, so I will use the remaining few minutes that I have on brainstorming a little bit on what the thermodynamic implications are, whether a resource theory of uncomplexity can be defined and so on with questions of an operational nature in mind. So asking like how complexity can capture what we can do operational to a system when we are complexity constrained in quantum computing, when realizing a heat engine of a kind or so. We have seen this plot earlier of, of, a, of a string that kind of arranges pure quantum states according to their complexity with a low complexity state sitting on the left side. And there is the um, conjecture of 
Brown and Suskin of a second law of complexity that would argue that um, states are only allowed to develop into states of higher complexity under their own natural um, dynamics. Now, this reminds us very much of a, another axis, that of mixedness, of entropy, if you want, and the famous, like familiar second law coming along with it, the second law of thermodynamics that's basically saying that states want to go to, 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 to higher entropy. If you have a child, you know very much know what, the, what that means. Um, basically guided by the question of what processes can be performed by a macroscopic observer. Not so much asking questions about complexity, but what can be done by or how a macroscopic observer would see things happening. And then we see things seemingly going to settings of, 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 of higher entropy. So on the complexity side, we would ask, say, how a computational, how computational resources um, can be captured to carry out a given process. And we can think a bit on how the middle ground would be like, where there's an interplay between entropy on the one hand and then complexity notions on the other at hand of a most paradigmatic process, namely that of Landauer um, erasure. Now, Landauer erasure is the task of resetting a quantum memory, a collection of systems, or resetting a collection of quantum systems prepared in some unknown mixed state. And this resetting will have a price. The state has an entropy. This entropy has to go somewhere. We have to dump it. We have to take this entropy and dump it as heat in the environment. That's part responsible for the heating of our computers. That's Landauer heat. Actually, not most of it, but a big chunk of it. And this heat that's being dumped into the environment has to be compensated by work that we invest in the, in, in, in the system. Erasure requires thermodynamic work. And there's Landau's principle that states that we need that um, we need to invest kt log two of work per discarded bit in the environment at the, that's prepared at a temperature t. Now we can make it a little bit of a slightly more refined setting of having like some quantum states where maybe some of the registers are known pure states, others are mixed states, maybe there's some correlations and so on going on in, 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 in the setting. So if you have this state given, we can think of um, like compressing the entropy, like doing a Schumacher compression, compressing the entropy in the corner, to have like pure registers and the entropy sitting there in the corner, assuming that there's no work cost coming along with this compression. And then we have our nice qubit setting there and only the, the noisy chunk needs to be uh, reset. And then there's a big body of literature on the resource theoretic um, incarnation of quantum thermodynamics that really very precisely look at, looks at this question and that one finds that the total work cost that needs to be invested in this setting in this kind of resource theoretic framework would be like kt log t times some entropic measure of a state that basically captures the number of qubits that we really need to reset using like Landau's um, erasure. So this is like the, the, the work side of things, like the, the entropy side of things, but there's also the, the complexity side of things. So let's think of a, of a pure state of maybe high complexity, maybe exponential complexity in the, in the number of qubits. And then again, you would like to reset to a fiducial state, like to the all zero state. And we can do that by again, doing a Schumacher compression, then we kind of do the computation. We basically undo the computation. We uncompute the setting, which we can do. as a U, we do a U dagger in a way. And we can do so at no work cost, but possibly at a high complexity. If we really undo this exponentially deep circuit, then, well, we have to invest another exponentially deep circuit to, to undo the computation that's at no work cost, but at a high, possibly exponential um, complexity cost. That's the one strategy. But there's also the other strategy of, um, 
of, of not caring about this being a pure state or whatever, and just resetting the system using lambda or erasure at little complexity, but then at a, at a work cost of the type that we have seen earlier. So that suggests that there should be a kind of a trade-off between work, entropy-related measures on the one hand, and complexity notions on the other. And this kind of thinking motivated us to think more in terms of general tasks of like processing quantum information, of thinking of thermodynamic tasks of a kind where complexity restrictions come into play. So we could think of an arbitrary quantum state rho, where we apply some circuit of a kind to get as many as we can zero registers out that's need, that needs to be maximized with a rest chunk that's being reset under the Landauer erasure. And we've been thinking like, what's the maximum number of, of, of zeros we can get out under the constraint that there's a, that the circuit is at most R gate. So under the complexity constraint of R for the respective quantum circuit. And for this, we find the result that the, the number, the optimal number of, of, of um, qubits that we can get out is N minus an entropic quantity that captures this complexity constraint setting that has the operational interpretation of the amount of work that's required to reset a state for an agent that can do at most R gates. So it's kind of complexity constraint in, 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 in a way. So what is this entropy measure? That's a new quantity, the new entropy measure that's kind of derived from the hypothesis testing entropy that accounts for the complexity. So this can be written as such as, as, as written here. So there's a trace Q that the Q is like a, a P of M element. Yeah, but it's not an arbitrary P of M element, but it's one that's constrained in the sense that it must be realizable with a circuit of complexity R. And um, there's the trace of Q rho larger than eta, and eta is the role of a success probability. So that would be like one minus epsilon that should be close to, to, to one ideally. You ask like how mixed must rho be in, the, in, 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 in this quantity? This kind of is the quantity that, that captures this task in an operational fashion. So there's many properties that we have looked at and, they, and they derived. So um, it's a variant of a hypothesis testing entropy. There's some properties we can prove. So it's monotonous in R, that's, that's a good thing. Also in, in eta and this success probability. And there's a kind of a couple of intuitive properties this has. For example, if we are very, if R is very small and we are very much restricted in what we can do, the circuits are, are teeny weeny, they're, they're short. So then the, um, the states we have, they can appear highly mixed because we can't undo the computation as on this complexity scale. So we have a high Landauer cost because we have to reset something. We cannot undo things. Whereas it's monotonous and going down at, at, at very large R, we see that this really goes to the standard hypothesis testing entropy where we have no complexity constraint um, whatsoever. There's also a couple of other properties we can prove. There's other things that we don't have, but by definition, that's a feature, not a bug. For example, it's not unitarily invariant, but that's a good thing because it's a complexity constrained quantity. So clearly it can't be unitarily invariant because well, the unitary could be very complex and would be kind of cheating to allow for arbitrary unitary deformations of, of, of a kind. So we said, oh, there's also a paper coming at some point that kind of really quietly and silently goes through all these properties of, 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 of this quantity. This also motivated us to think more about um, like a resource theory of complexity where the, the uncomplexity are like the scrap paper, they're the, the precious resource that you have or, or might have in, in, in a computation where we think of tasks of like uncomplexity extraction where we distill pure qubits from a given quantum state in a complexity restricted fashion. You want to get these pure qubits out. And kind of the converse process of uncomplexity expenditure that where you start out in, in, in scrap paper, like in uncomplex states, like in pure states, and have some junk and apply a circuit that's um, constrained, like R complexity constraint, where you want to prepare a state that an agent cannot distinguish or discriminate from the anticipated um, role at hand. So that's kind of similar to 
like the entanglement cost and the entanglement of distillation, as we know it from entanglement theory, here kind of um, formulated in terms of a resource theory of uncomplexity and um, like being motivated by how we can see uncomplex states as a resource for computational tasks. And we, we set out in a, in a way to tackle the question whether yet another brown Soskin conjecture can be shown, namely whether a resource theory of uncomplexity can be formulated. And yeah, the answer seems yes, it seems so. So that's governed by the complexity entropy and both tasks are kind of defined in their optimal um, probability of success in the, in, the, in, the, in the resource theoretical framework in terms of the um, entropy measure that I've just shown a, a minute ago. So we can think of a, of a resource theory of uncomplexity. We can also define monotones that would grow. So one can also relate this to this kind of second law of complexity growth that I have mentioned earlier. Good, 50 minutes into the talk and I promise to be short. So that's a, maybe a good moment to, to, to keep the promise. So it's a good moment to, to, to wrap up. Uh, so this I'm, I'm showing here. So um, some of the slides I um, kind of modified and, and took from a slide I gave earlier this year at CERN where there was a crowd that was interested in black holes and it was kind of cute to see that my daughter in, in second grade at the time was giving her first talk ever with a power presentation, they actually gave a talk on black holes in her class. It was kind of cute that myself and my daughter on the same day gave, in a sense, a talk about black holes. And me at CERN, my daughter in high school, that was kind of a fun coincidence. It was, it was not said, that was really a pure coincidence that this happened on the same day. I, I found that kind of interesting and funny. Anyway, um, let's call it a day. So in this talk, we had a look at a pretty simple question. I mean, simple, not judged from its solution, but simple from the from the outset, from the from the motivation of the problem. We we ask the question: What happens to the circuit complexity? So the number of gates you need to capture a given unitary for random circuits in as a function of the depth of the quantum circuit? Because Brown and Suskin have conjectured that this should go linearly in the circuit depth. Not easy to decide because, well, it's a it's complicated hard problem to compute this complexity. But we found that if you have a random quantum circuit, the shortest description, so to say, will also grow linearly with the size of the circuit. There's no hardly any redundancy. You can compress a bit, but not so much. It will still grow linearly with the size. There's only a bit of um, of like uh, undoing of, 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 of um, going back happens along the way. So there's a linear growth of the complexity as a function of the circuit depth. That's a fair resolution of this brown Suskin conjecture. We were like very happy. Secretly also because of the methods coming in of the semi-algebraic geometry, it's kind of a, a cute new portfolio of methods in this context, but it's also nice to see this kind of conjecture settled in a nice and, and, and fair fashion. That said, well, it's just more the beginning of a program than the end. I've already mentioned that maybe the weakest link to our work of, of our work is that we would like to be able to say more about approximate notions. I don't want to oversell. This is maybe the something we, we should work harder on. The methods as we have them are maybe not powerful enough, but we are not so sure about that either. But let's see, that would be interesting to, to say more about this. And this is surely a, a, a construction site for further thinking. Then we have this tool available. It would be good and it must be done that we should connect this more to the holographic setting as it's formulated and, and see what it means. And Rob Myers had a couple of ideas on, on how one can, could read these settings. That would be highly interesting to see what this now means for the high energy context where all this, uh, this comes from in a literal reading of this, of this conjecture. I've already hinted at the connection to Nielsen cost. That's kind of how high energy people usually see this notion. That's great. There's something to be said already. I would like to know more about this. Um, this has to be established. Also, we would like to know more about the connection to entanglement. I've already mentioned this kind of baby step of a connection of complexity and entanglement, but it would be super nice to have stronger statements that relate to say multipartite incremental entangling bounds 
of a kind that would give rise to stronger bounds of this sort. I've been thinking quite a bit about this in my early morning hours over the last weeks. It's not easy, but uh, let's see what it would be nice to see more of a connection to, to entanglement comp compared to notions of, of complexity of a kind. Then, yes, random circuits are proxies for Hamiltonian dynamics, for actual dynamics, for quantum chaos. And again, one should say more about this, about this link. We, we started from proxies for quantum chaos, but well, at some point it would be nice to relate more to the actual quantum chaos. That's something we surely have on the radar and there's more to be done, but I put it here on the list of open questions that we should and, and, and must um, think about. Something we are working on, and that's some early progress, is like circuit complexity with measurements, where you do measurements along the way. We know that circuits with and without measurements are very different. For example, we know that linear depth circuits are not very powerful with no measurements, but for example, you can't prepare topological states, you can't prepare GZ, GZ states and so on, but if you add measurements, you can. Um, so what's happening to the complexity goes with measurements, there's some results that see how it goes, but that's really an, an, an interesting question. There's connections to quantum error corrections or deep F circuits have to be. To quantum advantages, this is something I, I, I mentioned at the very beginning that also relates to Scott's work. So we know that if circuits are not deep enough, then we can't come up with an argument that um, kind of that it's hard to sample from a distribution classically efficiently that's sufficiently close in a precise sense to the output distribution of the random circuit followed by measurements. But like at, at what point you have a kind of transition and how does the notions of complexity relate to computational task and computational like, task in, in random sampling schemes and quantum advantages, this should be fleshed out in, in, in more detail and surely um, something on the agenda for future work. And um, nine o'clock on my side, that's kind of surely one hour beyond that time. So I think that's a, the perfect moment to stop. So I think with this, um, I would like to thank you very much for your precious um, attention. And I'm very much looking forward to questions you might possibly have. Thanks so much for your attention. Great. Um, thanks, Jens. That's a really nice talk. Um, I think there are, there are a number of questions. And if anybody else wants to, you know, there are some questions in the Q&A, but uh, there are also, uh, if people have questions, please raise your hands, or if you're on the panel, you can, you can also um, try to ask. In the meantime, just to just to start it off, let me let me just ask you. Uh, sorry, is is there also a first law of uh, complexity? <laughs> um, that is an interesting question. Um... um... So it would be like a, uh, 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 huh? Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't quite know what it would be. Like, what's what's what is it that's um that's being preserved in in, in, yeah, in this yeah, first? Yeah. Um, uh, maybe, maybe I mean, the, 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 the connection with the, the analogy to the second law makes really sense. I mean, it's really like a, it's it's in in a way almost the same thing of things being. I mean, in 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 one side you're like uh, constrained in your in your position, you can make a measurement, like what a microscopic uh, observer would see, like if you make a coarse grain measure, you would see things seemingly having more entropy and, and also very much related, things become more complex over time because it, you never go back, that it's a very much of, of, of a similar notion, but the first law, I don't know, um, I, I would have to think about this because I wouldn't even know what the analog of, of, of like what's, what is it that's, that's constant. And I wouldn't know what the zeroth law is for that matter, or just maybe the existence of a complexity of a kind. But uh, I, I, that's um, I, I don't know. But that's a good question. So, so maybe can I can I can I come at it in a different way? It's again a naive question, but um, how important, you know, how, uh, you know, so so how easy to, is it to so if you're if you're making up a theory a, a kind of thermodynamics of complexity. Um, how much does the second law, the the significance of the second law, rest on the first law? So, how easy is it to skip over the first law while while uh, you know 
is, is what I'm is is what I'm trying to understand. Uh, um, there are uh, different notions. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, you, I mean, you you need the zeroth law of thermodynamics, right, to to talk about things, and you need, um, I mean, the the, the, the second law is kind of is is kind of in in thermodynamics, thermodynamics is kind of set up by the um by the notion of an integrating factor to have a certain differential form um you it's largely independent of the first law mm -hmm. yeah so you don't need the first law for the second law so in this sense um there's not a logical contradiction of not having a first law while stating a second law in a way that's a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit hand wave, head wave yeah mm -hmm. yeah what's your view sorry Richard. Yeah. So, so wouldn't you say first of all the the third law, or uh, uh, you know the the law that says oh, what's the uh, th I mean, so did you did you say that you rest on the zero or third law? Is that what you said earlier? Um, I, oh you said no, 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 I mean, I, I think that I, I would I said I would one would make be able to sense of uh, what would make sense of of a zero law, like they they the existence of yeah. What is the zero law? Oh, it's just the, the existence of a, of a phenomenological the existence of a phenomenological temperature in phenomenological uh, thermodynamics. So that's like the that would be like yeah, an, an existence statement that that would would I mean, carry over. Get a first the law, law, you... third law would be interesting. What's what's the the third law of complexity? Um, well, the third law not, in thermodynamics, the third law is not true. It says that the ground state has zero degeneracy and has a and and uh, that's not true for many systems. But but you know, for the first law, you need an analog of a notion of cost, and so you could imagine a notion. Yeah, of, yeah but what is the cost? What is the cost? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, certainly for real circuits, there's a cost, right? They use power. They use this, that, and the other. So you know, you could wonder if that has a bearing on on. Oh, you would, you would take, that's right. So we take basically like a literal first law. You would say that the, there's an experimentalist doing stuff in a lab, and then this guy has to pay a price for energy, and that's particularly pricey these days. And then this is the first law of complexity because that's the price bill to be paid to mm. our friends in Perhaps. Russia. So yeah, I, I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Cost, uh, it, it seems a little little bit unsatisfying to me because. You know, to me, the first law is about conservation, right, of, of some quantity. And so what's the quantity being conserved here? Uh, yeah. But maybe Scott what, has something to say. I mean, uh, could we back up a little bit and ask, like, in what sense is there even a second law of complexity? Uh, because, you know, I mean, it, certainly there are particular cases where it is true that circuit complexity increases with time, you know, and, and uh, uh, Jens's talk provided a beautiful example, right? When you have a quantum system, a pure state, you know, subject to a random sequence of, of independent gates, then complexity increases for exponential time. Okay, there are many other natural situations where complexity can stay the same or can decrease over time. Right. Uh, so, you know, uh, Sean Carroll and I, you know, a decade ago were, you know, thinking about how, like, you know, as, uh, uh, you know, um, um, after the Big Bang, you know, you, you get condensation into, you know, stars and galaxies. And it seems like most natural measures of the complexity of, you know, the resulting state have gone up. But then in the end, there is the heat death of the universe when we're, we'll all be back in, you know, uh, 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 um, you know, some some uh, uh, high, you know, the entropy will have continued to increase. So we'll be in a very high entropy state, but in some sense, it will be a very low complexity state, you know, at least at least uh, uh, in the classical setting, at least in our branch of the wave function, right? So, you know, there are cases, there are many situations where like the second law of thermodynamics is true and a second law of complexity is simply not true, right? Complexity can first increase and then decrease. So like, what is the uh, uh, realm of, of, of applicability of the claimed second law of complexity? Yeah, this is this is a wonderful point. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more because I mean, in, in this sense, the second law of thermodynamics is more set in stone than the second law of of, of complexity. And um, I mean, there there are ways in which one can make sense of the um, like second law of complexity in, in in a kind of quantifiable way. In our paper on uncomplexity on this resource theory, we even comment on this. Like we we look at like fuzzy operations that are like certain circuits that are have a little bit of added noise to them. And we have like certain uh, um, 
like um, monotones for which like the complexity like entropy or so we, for which one can show that they indeed increase monotonously with the with the um with the depth under fuzzy operations which kind of does a baby step in, in a good direction but it's maybe not the full picture because there's fuzzy operations where the kind of the randomness of the setting is kind of in in, in some sense put in by hand is, is actually nicole in the in the in the in the audience she might even be while being a a, a co-author on this like even disagree on with this picture but but so there's some senses in which one can formulate this precisely but i i, I see your point that there could be settings where you get a very complex state, but at some point it gets uncomplex again, and you come you come back to a, a low complexity point, and this might well happen. So I think it's not fully clear. I think I tend to agree what this fully general second law of complexity should be, if you really want to see it formulated as, as a theorem, as a, as a quantifiable theorem. And and again, oh. yeah, I showed something, but. It's a certain set, yeah. or or not even as a theorem, but even just as a statement that empirically is true across a wide range of situations. I just want to know what are those situations where we're claiming that it's empirically true? Yeah. Um, yeah. Even in statistical mechanics, uh, in a bounded system, eventually you get Poincaré recurrences, so you come back, so actually you go back down. So so these are really statements about coarse graining and certain amounts of ranges of time. Yeah, um, right. Now, Poincaré recurrences, that would also be true for the second law of thermodynamics, right? Yeah, so that's what I said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I may say so, I mean, that's of course obvious to everybody, but there's of course two recurrences, right? Um, there's the Poincaré recurrence that uh, happens at um, at a time that's like doubly exponential in the system size, so it would be idiotically large for even tiny systems, but there's also like this, um, like yeah. Deep Robinson uh, type recurrence that you often see even in labs where all that matters, you have a local excitation that propagates with the system and it sees the boundary conditions and it comes back. And when the, the leap Robinson cone sees itself, you can see a recurrence. And that is kind of happening at, at, at early times and when the second law is like seemingly violated and so on, that happens very early on. So that's of course- I, I, I mean, these things and depend on- uh, Sorry, can we, um, you know, since we have already sort of- we made, we a bit far on the panel, off. maybe we can- have the videos pinned uh, for the panelists. And in the meantime, there's there's one question from the audience. So let me allow Jake uh, Delscani to, to ask his question. Hi, um, I thank you very much for the talk. It was very, uh, very interesting, extremely interesting. Um, um, I was wondering if the contraction maps that you defined there, uh, are those actually projections or, or polynomial maps? Oh, they're polynomial maps. So they're okay. basically just, I mean, they're just the kind of the realization of the unitaries in 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 the circuit. They're polynomial maps that map an architecture to a unitary. Oh, okay, because as far as I remember, the uh, tarski sindberg uh, uh, theorem is for projections. Is there a reference that it says uh, is true also for polynomials? For polynomial well, maps? To, well, to be fair, it is actually a polynomial projection because you would get um uh you 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 get it, it's the map from like input is the architecture like the placement of the circuits and then you get U of A as the set of units that you get given the unitaries of the of the the R unitary gates that 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 you put in. So, oh, I see. Um, I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Great. So so well, we've already sort of unofficially started the panel, but. Um, let me let me just introduce the panelists anyway. Well, the first one, uh, you know, Scott doesn't need an introduction here. He's been on many times, but he's particularly it's particularly appropriate he's on this panel because um, because of course he you know uh, of his interest in all aspects of this from complexity theory to uh, random quantum circuits to uh, to these connections with quantum gravity. So uh, so maybe Scott, after introducing the rest, I'll, rest, I'll, I'll Give you the first shot at uh, commenting on on the talk and bringing up what you what you want to say. Um, there's Nick Nick Hunter Jones from Stanford, who um, um, you know who's worked uh, extensively on information scrambling. He's he's a he's really one of the experts on T designs and Wait, so, Stanford uh, now now UT Austin. Oh, sorry, I said oh. now UT Austin. Is it? No, uh, no. Well, I don't. I mean, 
Yeah, there's some transition happening over the next two months. Okay, so, so <laughs> Mid transition. So in, in, in a superposition between Stanford and UT Austin, yet to be measured. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, Vijay uh, Balasubramanian uh, from, uh, from uh, UPenn, who, uh, who is um, uh, who's a theoretical physicist, um, uh, who is um, interested not just in aspects of, uh, um, of uh, you know, the quantum information, information paradox in, in black holes, but also he he has many sides to him. He's a biophysicist pursuing questions in neuroscience, and he's he has work uh, taught about machine learning and statistical inference. So uh, really great to have you on the panel, Vijay. And uh, so Scott, can I turn to you for for your comment? Sure. Yeah. So 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 thank you, Jens, for a really nice talk. I mean, I I was a big fan of this result when I. Uh, 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 saw it come out, but uh, uh, I have to uh, confess something, right? Which, you know, you talked about resolving the uh, Brown and Susskind conjecture. Now, you know, when I heard Brown and Susskind start talking about this stuff uh, back in 2014 or so, mm -hmm. you know, I had a complete, a very different understanding of what their conjecture even was <laughs> than. Uh, uh, hey. Um, so, uh, so, so it seems like there, you know, may, maybe there were, there were two different Brown Susskin conjectures and, you know, and I think the difference between them is maybe relevant for people since, uh, uh, it's useful for them to understand. So, 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 so the, so the version that, that I had understood was about a time independent Hamiltonian. Right. So, you know, imagine you know, like the same thing keeps happening to your state over and over again. Right. Uh, uh, you know, so like you have some H and then you just get get like, you know, psi zero is your initial state and you get E to the minus I H T psi zero, where T just becomes larger and larger, you know, eventually exponential. And the question was, you know, does does this cause the circuit complexity of the resulting state to increase linearly with, with T for an exponential time. Now, the version that you talked about was the uh, a version we could say with a time dependent Hamiltonian, right? Or, you know, if we want to think about it in discrete language, you know, my version would be the, the same sequence of gates is applied over and over. Your version is, you know, a new independent set of random gates gets totally, applied yeah. at every time step. Okay, now these these two versions are really like crucially different in terms of what we can expect to prove about them using the tools that you know the, the, that exist today, right? With the 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 uh, time independent version, the version with the you know the same Hamiltonian that goes on and on and on, right? We could you know like one, one thing that I you know just realized immediately was that if p were equal to p space for example so if there was some big collapse of you know conventional complexity classes then the conjecture of you know linear growth of circuit complexity for exponential time would simply be false right it would just have no hope of being true because you know a, a uh, in polynomial space you can just go and explicitly calculate what are all of the amplitudes that you want you know uh, uh, and and you know you could you could just if p were equal to p space it would mean you could just go and prepare the final state using a polynomial size circuit so therefore any you know and of course I pointed this out to Suskind at the time and he said okay so then go make whatever conjectures you computer science people like to make and then and then can you prove that this statement is true and i said okay now we're talking right and so then you know i, I did manage to prove um some kind of you know complexity growth for over an exponential amount of time under uh the assumption that uh p space is not contained in pp slash poly Right, so there's some, you know, reasonable looking complexity conjecture where if it's true, then you can say, you know, and if furthermore, you have a time independent Hamiltonian that, um, um, uh, you know, has has the right properties, right? It's not not every Hamiltonian that will do this. I mean, you know, the zero Hamiltonian will never create any complexity, yeah, right? right? And so I remember at the time, Lenny and uh, and Maldacena and others, you know, had said, well, well, maybe the, the the relevant property is some kind of chaos, some kind of you know chaotic behavior of the Hamiltonian. Uh, I was not able to formalize that, but I was able to take a related idea which is you know, computational universality, right? If your 
uh, uh, Hamiltonian is able to sort of implement one step of a P-based computation, let's say, you know, as would be the case for many, rever even just classical reversible cellular automata or things of that kind, then we can sort of encode in a P-based computation in such a way that, you know, after exponential time, we should get a state with exponential complexity, you know, unless, unless there is this com collapse of complexity classes. Uh, now, um, I was unable to confirm Lenny's conjecture that the complexity will increase linearly, you know, at most under some, you know, under the strongest kind of uh, uh, well understood hypothesis, I could say that, you know, after t time, the circuit complexity will be at most t to some constant power you know, T to some, uh, you know, I don't know, the one one hundredth power or something, you know, and that was not good enough for him. He said, no, I want it to, to, to be linear. I said, okay, well, it probably is linear, but, you know, you've just got to stick your neck out now and just, you know, conjecture that. I can't, but, you know, uh, back it up via a, 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 a reduction. Okay, now uh, uh, what, what, what you did, what you and Nicole and the others did in this beautiful recent work was, you know, to, you know, use, you know, from my point of view, use, you know, the, the very venerable and, and, and excellent strategy of, of solving a research problem by changing the problem. Okay. Uh, so, you know, which, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, and I don't, you know, far from meaning this as a criticism, I was like, you know, kicking myself, like, why didn't I think of changing the problem in that particular way? Right. Yeah. You know, you looked at, you know, uh, uh, okay, well, what if the, you know, you had a different set of gates at every time step, right? And then, you know, you, th you say, you know, intuitively it should be, you know, all the clearer that complexity should, should just increase linearly with time. But now, you know, unlike in, in the case that I studied, there is a hope to just prove it completely unconditionally, right? And the reason is that, that now you're in the realm where you can hope to apply some sort of counting argument. Right. Or, you know, not, you know, maybe maybe less a counting argument than a dimension argument. Right. Uh, you know, now you can so, so bring algebraic geometry to bear, you know, as you explained in the talk. And you can say, well, as you get to higher and higher depth, you're generating a higher and higher dimensional um, what is semi algebraic set. Right. And, you know, you just if you have a smaller circuit, I just don't have enough dimensions to sort of cover all of the stuff that I am, you know, thereby creating. OK, so that so that was, a, um, you know, a beautiful thing to to actually, you know, formalize and prove. Right. It's like, you know, once, you know, um, you know, I like like it, 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 it's one of these things where like, like, you know, yeah, um, yes, it, you, you know, what, 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 once it once it's once it's done, it's like, you know, it's like uh, people are like, oh, well, you know, I, 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 I should have realized that that can and should be done. OK, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I did have one um, maybe little technical question for you. Um, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, so you talked about how a constant number of T gates suffice for, yeah. uh, what was it, for, 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 for T designs. Okay, so, so I don't know if you're aware, uh, there is a, a brand oh. new paper by a group of students uh, here at UT Austin, uh, Sabi Grewal, Vishnu Iyer, William Kretschmer, and Daniel Liang, um, which shows that a, a constant number of T gates does not suffice for producing a pseudo random quantum state. So in other words, if you want a state that will look like a Haar random state with respect to, you know, whatever polynomial time measurement you, you could apply, then they show that you need at least um, order log n T gates. Okay, and they, give, they do this by giving an explicit algorithm that can actually distinguish a state, you know, with a small number of T gates or with a small enough uh, stabilizer extent. Or, or uh, some measure like that from a truly random quantum state. Um, so, so, so uh, here, here, here's the paper. Uh, so my question was about, you know, how do we reconcile that with your claim that a constant number of T gates suffice? Are they just, are they just two different questions? Uh, okay, well, wonderful. So thanks a lot. Yeah. I mean, that, sure. that was hugely interesting what you said. It's like basically a talk in its own right. So, so I'm the panelist and you're the, the speaker. <laughs> and I'm also aware of your beautiful work um, in, the, in the past that like, relates this question to notions of complexity. Mm. Um, it's also, I mean, I, I see this like as, as an argument how um, inspiring Lenny is in a way, because that's, we, we had, I have this question that you mentioned on the radar. In fact, I 
when I mentioned on my last slide, we would have the connection to the true quantum chaos. I actually meant the Hamiltonian version, so the time uh, independent version, which I read as a variant of the original problem. Ah. So I I saw the two problems exactly the other way around, <laughs> which is oh. kind of funny okay. when you think about this. Um, so I, I know this variant, and I, I saw this as a variant. Never mind. Uh, these are both interesting questions. Um, and um, I, 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 I know the question. So there's, of course, there's also big literature in, 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 in random quantum circuits and what properties they have and so on in all the readings from the mathematical side, but all going all the way to condensed matter and, and to high energy. So in this, in this lingo, people discriminate, discriminate like Brownian circuits from Floquet circuits. Like the Brownian would be what we have, like take a new hard random guy every, every time and look at a deep circuit. Whereas the Floquet thing would be like AB, 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 AB type where you one straw randomness and then you do the same thing over and over again. And right. that's what you said, basically. You have a fixed mm -hmm. random Hamiltonian and then you trotterize it maybe and then you get something, there's some randomness, but you fix it once and for all and it's been repeated over, over, over time. And I agree, this is very natural. And, and when I complained that I would like to know more about this at the very end, I meant your reading of the brown Zaskin conjecture Oh, I'm, I'm losing control over the conjectures best besides the second law of complex is also brown Zaskin conjecture. So <laughs> it's more like a, a portfolio of brown Zaskin conjectures. Never mind, I, I know this problem and we are thinking about this, but it's not easy. Um, yeah. Uh, so in a way, because you don't have enough randomness available. Um, right. So counting mm -hmm. arguments, you seem to say this yourself, are not so easy because um, it's, it's a kind of interplay of the Hamiltonian dynamics and the randomness you have initially that brings you always to a new realm. But having new randomness available in each step makes this step much easier. Whereas if you're repeating with the same thing that presumably it's the same thing happening, mathematically speaking, but it's very difficult to, to capture. So no, they require a in the that, space, so yes. But even a new student who thinks deeply about this, he got a bit distracted by new doing work on measurements and he's making progress. But that's a secret, like like other pathway to overcome the hardness of the problem that you you sketched. So I'm much aware of the problem. I would have loved to solve it, but um, or, or contribute in, in one way or the other to doing that. Um, yeah, it is what it is. Ah, then ah, computationally universal. Yeah, of course. I mean, oh, our circuits are computationally universal because they are random and that's set up. Also, I mean the the notion of exact complexity would be really awkward if you have not a universal gate set. That's kind of funny, but this is of course the case. And on, on your last point on the on the um, on the um, on the designs, this is not a contradiction because it really matters on the fine print of approximation. So um, there's a relationship, and Nick can truly comment on this. Um, being a, a design expert. There's a very clear notion between a unitary design on the one hand, like designs in the unitary group, and spherical designs, like complex spherical designs, which are the same thing on, on the state vector level. In fact, take a fiducial state and then you apply unitary design, you get uh, automatically a, a spherical design. But the fine print matters. And um, so the sense of approximation matters. So if you have a weaker sense of or a different sense of approximation, we also get the log n dependence. So the way we set it up is a fair way of thinking of an approximate design in a way, and then we get this N independence, which is like striking, but um, if you made use of the right sense of approximation that would relate this notion to the appropriate notion on the level of spherical designs, I thought I would think there's no contradiction and there would be, we get the log N dependence as they have them. That's what I would think. Um, Nick, can you confirm this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't read this most recent paper, but I expect that to get the statement that you know some design implies this notion of computational pseudo randomness, you probably need to take some strong notion of design, which requires taking some approximation error to be exponentially small. And just as you pointed out, that gives you some independence in the number of T gates you need to get designs. So presumably to get one to imply the other, the, the lack of contradiction is gonna be resolved by the fact that you need to take a certain approximation, which will make the results agree. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. Then, and then and maybe see. maybe one other point. Yeah, I think this is also well, that's a good uh, point. It was good. well observed. So yeah, that's nice. Okay. Thank you. So it's also not something I know for for complexity. <clears throat> so to prove to prove that, um, or I guess the way we know how to relate like complexity and and unitary designs, 
uh, uh, you know, also requires, I mean, we use approximate designs and there's a very specific step where you bound, you basically want to bound the probability that some fixed unitary is far away from like a design element uh, in, yeah, yeah. in basically a trace distance. In this kind of hypothesis testing framework. Mm -hmm. And and to do this, you use Markov's inequality and you bound sort of moments moments of traces of these unitaries. And, and I guess the way we use designs in that step requires taking like the additive error to be exponentially small. Um, so that, and this is fine if you have like 1D circuits because you have some log one over epsilon. And if you take that exponentially small, it just gives you some factor that you don't care about basically. Um, but for, for, for these, uh, homeopathic circuits, like this would necessarily mean that the number of T gates you need is like system size dependent, but this could also just be like, I don't, I don't know, you know, this is just some step in a proof where it's convenient to take this, uh, additive error to be a relative error. And it's, uh, I have no idea if like, uh, if that's actually necessary. So I, I think it's, you know, I think if you want to get the same steps of the proof to work for these Clifford circuits with T gates, uh, for complexity, you do need like a system size dependent number of T gates, but that yeah. could also just be like a poor step in the proof which you could optimize. And, and maybe these homeopathic circuits with, uh, like a very few a system size independent number of T gates actually do give you, uh, the complexity growth. Oh yeah, wonderful ideas, wonderful point. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with everything you say. I think also that resolves. We, we agree already on, on on the resolution of this. Yeah, I also agree on the on the on the on the notion of approximation that you need to make the connection between designs and and complexity. That's right. I mean, that's also I, I, I've cited your work, and I've, I should stress the beautiful work that also Nick has done together with Fernando and so on and others on on, on this work on this on this um um on this question. And yes, I, I, I mean, clearly there's an, a dependence on the on the system size and the number of tickets you need, but this could be a flaw of the proof. I mean, how, how do we know? As you say, I, I, I agree. Um, I mean, if they should. I, I think for us, I mean, I sneak this in a bit actually. To be, I, mean, I even said this that this would have. I, I call it procrastination. I couldn't just resist on on saying this because it kind of I find it funny that any meaningful notion of approximation that is kind of traded on the on the market would have that feature, which I find really quite quite striking. But um, of course, not. It, it, there's more to be said on the on the question. It's, yeah, I mean, if they should truly deserve the name of homeopathic circuits, then the fewer the T gates you have, you know, the better the mixing property should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And then, uh, <laughs> the, that, that that at least okay, is not good. the case here. Then then we, then we failed. So it's not quite homeopathic. <laughs> we also deleted the type because then it became too much with a with a. Um, with the email requests of us <laughs> doing like quantum healing and saving the world. Um. <laughs> On that note, so uh, Vijay, do you have any? Uh... Sure, yeah. So first of all, beautiful talk and I loved the paper, uh, but I do concur that I don't think this is the Brown-Susskind conjecture. So the Brown-Susskind okay, conjecture good. is about uh, physical systems in which there is a Hamiltonian and the idea is you can phrase it in various variants of it, either in the holographic context, there's some notion that there is some notion of complexity of the growth of the, some, some notion of complexity associated with the time development of a, quant of a fixed quantum system okay. that is somehow related to, uh, let's say volume or something in the space. Now there okay. are many problems there. One is, uh, of course, if one thing is increasing monotonically in time, and another thing is increasing monotonically in time for a long time, you know, just because they're both increasing monotonically doesn't mean they're equal, right? This yes. means they're increasing monotonically in time. So this, uh, and there's a proof required there of a relationship. So the, all, that's been completely missing. And that's, of course, one of the goals that one would have in the field. But yeah, secondly, yeah. Uh, secondly, in terms of the complexity growth, you know, so really the question there is, if I give you a fixed Hamiltonian, right, there are some theories that are in some sense simple, like integrable theories, where the entire dynamics may be controlled by three numbers, the integration constants of the theory from which you can specify for the dynamics. Whereas chaotic dynamics, where that's not going to be the case. Now, in classical chaos, um, there's actually different degrees of chaos. So there are systems like the kicked rotor, where in some regime of parameters, you'll find that it's not chaotic anywhere. Then you tweak it. And then for some other parameter, it's chaotic in some regions of its phase space, but not others. And then in some other region of the parameters, it's chaotic everywhere. And actually, in the study of quantum chaos, it's not understood how that happened. So there are sort of deep and important questions about the nature of chaos and quantum mechanics. But this has a bearing on, that these questions have a bearing on. You might, you know, you'd readily imagine that there is a, uh, a, a, sort of, a, a, a sort of refined version of the conjecture 
which says that you know as you go as you increase the degree of chaos whatever that means in the Hamiltonian in the fixed Hamiltonian the rate of complexity growth or the persistence of complexity growth you know how long it stays for you know changes or something like that right so that uh, so that maximally chaotic theories whatever that precisely means have you know exponential growth for a long period of time so I think from the physics point of view those are the statements that are most interesting however however you know how uh, you know going back to the work of Eugene Wigner one of the things one the conjecture of Eugene Wigner many many decades ago was that if you take a sufficiently complicated Hamiltonian, like the one that controls nuclear uh, nuclei, so in nuclear physics, or sufficiently uh, complicated systems like that, then the conjecture uh, due to Wigner was that the spectrum of the Hamiltonian will be well approximated by that of a random matrix. That doesn't mean that if I give you a particular theory, like the theory of iron, that it is exactly the results of a random matrix, but that certain universal features of the spectrum will be controlled by a random matrix. So I personally think that these kinds of random circuits that are so beautifully being discussed both in your work and elsewhere may well be, turn out to be, capturing the universal features of, of, you know, of, of maximally chaotic dynamics because it could be that in a very chaotic system, the system changes and then it sort of reconfigured itself in such a complicated way that the next step is in some effective sense, essentially random, compared to the previous step. So that kind of thing could be very powerfully, I think, used. So, so I think these results that you're talking about are very important because they may well turn out to be the universal part of whatever answer you want to give for your strongly coupled, many-body interacting system. So I think, that, I think that's the way in which I, you know, I personally think of what I've learned. But one can make progress for the actual thing too. Mm -hmm. So for example, in our work, uh, you know, we just decided to just take seriously, you want to take Hamiltonians actual Hamiltonians that are chaotic or integrable and try to see how that complexity grows. And as you were mentioning, you know, we tend to, uh, in physics, uh, we often tend to take this uh, Nielsen point of view because it sort of feels natural for people who like continuous math, right? So the idea there, uh, just to recall, is that the complexity of, uh, so, well, anyway, time development is a, a trajectory on the unitary group. And so you want to find the shortest path in the appropriate complexity metric from the identity to, uh, uh, you know, to the, to the time evolution operator. And so you're supposed to find this, this path. So that's a geodesic problem for which we've actually made a lot of progress. So you can solve that problem to some extent. And um, you can show that universally, uh, in fact, the initial growth of the geodesic length is linear. So there's this initial linear growth. Really, the question is, does it truncate? And there are two modes in which you can truncate. There are two kinds of shortcuts that could appear. One involves, you have this manifold, uh, you know, the unitary group is some strange fiber bundle, complicated fiber bundle. So one class of obstructions are the global obstructions. That is, you know, you come back around the other side, and that's the shortcut. You've been going this way with a Hamiltonian, and you come back around that side. So finding such global obstructions is a hard problem in topology and geometry. However, there's another very interesting class of obstructions called conjugate points, which are uh, sometimes when they accumulate, they indicate the presence of some sort of global obstruction. But actually, these are local obstructions, this complexity growth. So it turns out that you can directly give criteria related to things like spectral properties, properties of the eigenstates of a system, things that look like the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis criterion. You can, you can write down a number of criteria that are familiar in physics involving spectral properties of a theory that tell you um, the bound when these local obstructions are going to happen. So you can show, for example, that, um, and so this is what some of the stuff that we showed, that if you take sort of an integrable theories, at polynomial time, you begin to see these obstructions appearing, right? These local conjugate points. So you know that complexity growth terminates, uh, the linear complexity growth terminates at most at polynomial time in some of these integrable theories. Good, they're not maximally chaotic, so we didn't expect exponential growth. Another thing you can show by using the same criteria that is, if you take, uh, say, for example, chaotic examples of this SYK model, you know, other kinds of models like that, you can show that at exponential time, these local obstructions to complexity growth do occur. In other words, it's not the case that, the, that, the, that, that you can keep growing in complexity past exponential time. It will truncate in this particular way. So I think these are very interesting, and they connect directly 
to properties of dynamics of chaotic and integrable systems. So I think this is an interesting avenue that you know we were interested in in, in following, and that, that connects to some of the other things you said. You know, if you're going to connect to things in holography, you want to talk about the specific Hamiltonians and physical systems that have a relationship to holography. Random circuits don't. But it would be so cool to show that if I give you any one of these maximally chaotic theories, that there is something universal in their dynamics that is, in fact, captured by random circuits, perhaps because the state changes so much from step to step, but the effect of evolution in some appropriate sense is random. So I also want to raise that, you know, we're here very much talking in the circuit complexity kind of language. And, you know, Nielsen methods, of course, were designed as a way of, you know, giving some continuous math version of estimating things like uh, the circuit complexity. But the other notions you could invent. So, for example, imagine you say that a system, the time evolution in a quantum system is complicated if the wave function spreads in some sense. Um, uh, 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 well, the complexity of the evolution is related to the spread of the wave function over the Hilbert space. Now, what does that mean? At any given time, of course, you can pick your basis vector to be that state, so it feels like it isn't spreading. But you could say that you want to create a basis so that you can describe all, uh, you know, all, uh, all the state vectors, let's say, up to time t. I, 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 I don't want to just describe the state vector at time t, but I want to have a fixed basis to describe everything. And then you can write down a basis that minimizes the spread. So because you'd like a sort of uh, the basis in which the spread is asked, as, 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 as slow as possible. That, that would be a sensible way of trying to quantify how rapid the spread is. You pick a basis so that it's as slow as possible. So this method is going back to the 60s uh, due to a guy named Langshos, uh, some Hungarian guy, and Krilov and others, for how to compute such bases. And again, you can show that uh, you can construct integrable models like particles and group manifolds, and you can see that this thing truncates quickly and so on and so forth. And for chaotic examples, like the kind of uh, evolution expected in random matrix models, right? you can show that the growth is linear for an exponential amount of time and then plateaus. So that's another quantity, which I don't know precisely what, I mean, it's not entirely clear what the precise relationship between that kind of spread notion of complexity and circuit complexity is. Presumably, well, there may be a relation, there may not be a relation. I'm just pointing out that there's multiple quantities that have this kind of linear kind of growth. and. Uh, uh, and in that case, in the case of the wave function spread, provably so, you just calculate it and you demonstrate that it exists. And, and so, so going back to the question of what is the relationship with the volume growth in gravity and stuff like that, it's not obvious, I think, a priori, which of these notions, if any of them, is actually has a holographic dual in the volume. And I think it's very important to keep that in mind because all people run away and calculate volumes of gravity and say, oh, I've computed complexity. Well, it's very important here to define what you meant by complexity and which notion was being compared. So I think that's, that's uh, uh, but very exciting, right? I mean, the reason we do this is because we don't know the answer to that question or to many of these questions. So anyway, my two cents. Thanks. Thanks. For wow. <laughs> Thanks. That's, that's great. So, I mean, uh, uh, that's like more like the, the, the program of a, of a life career in science. <laughs> that you're presenting here. I hope you're not um, expecting I think, I think we're going to make I think we're going to make progress on this much quicker than a life career. I think I think all the people okay. are in no, place that's, that's fine. progress. Okay. We should actually uh, speaking of which we should also catch up soon on a one to one level and and discuss stuff a bit yes. so that we talk about um maybe too much for 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 this evening but um but there's many many interesting thoughts. So I mean first I noticed that you seem to be tending towards the Hamiltonian like, like the, the Floquet type reading of the conjecture anyway I, I noticed this I'm um, great I mean um, that, is a, that is their that is their that is what they write right I mean they're talking about physical systems that are changing not about random circuits I think, yeah. I think technically if you dive into that paper they do conjecture it for yeah I mean I'll take the opposing view from VJ and Scott that if you write something in a paper and you say you think it's true it's fair to call it a you know Brown's Zuskin conjecture so I think if you die, if you look in their paper they do say oh this should be true for random circuits so okay yeah. they say both so it's a better off I think we've come over this they're both interesting and in, in a way we say what we can say I mean I stated the, the assumptions and that's what we get so yeah and 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 um let me go through these 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 different points. I, I, I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, I also I'm, I'm aware of your beautiful work in in, in that context. Maybe um, uh, on the quantum chaos side, yeah. As you must know, there's lots of notions of quantum yeah. chaos, like integrability. I'm aware of five different meanings of integrability. Yeah. Um, 
and like being literally integrable in, in the sense of uh, classical mechanics and then having like a, a, a like n linearly independent uh, constant of motion that n algebraically independent constant of motion. There's lots of, there's beta integrability. There's lots of different notions and, and chaotic is, is a bit similar. There's system, systems that are quantum chaotic if the analogous classical mechanical Hamiltonian is, is chaotic. People talk about open quantum systems, which are in phase space chaotic. Then people talk about uh, properties of out of time or correlation functions. That these are all related, but not identical properties. It's nice, but you seem to be on the right path in the sense that uh, it's much easier to talk about what is not chaotic than what is chaotic. So that's a very wide step forward. So if you get the, these funny, well, um, actually, 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 Jens, I'm not sure that's the case. I'm starting to get the impression that it's a sort of bit Tolstoyan, right? Every integrable system is integrable in its own way, but all chaotic systems have something universal in them. So then, 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 to, okay, then, then that, that's good. But then that's something we need to sort out some other time. Um, I, I'm super interested to hear more about this. I mean, I mean actually, I, I should be honest that I'm way more um, knowledgeable on notions of integrability. I've written like a, a hundred pages review article on. Then on notions of chaos, I, I would be happy to hear more about your thoughts. Anyway, but anyway, what you said literally, and I, I agree, is that it seems to be easier to find what's not chaotic because if you get like constraints that you see um, constraining your dynamics, then you see funny things su such as there's a linear growth of complexity for time, but then it gets stuck because it can't go further because of the something, some uh, something non chaotic is, is, is coming. And that's super interesting and, and, and highly exciting. Then, ah, on the universality, um, I, I, I couldn't agree more that this is a, a super interesting uh, research question on like seeing what the universal part is. And of course, I'm aware of the literature on how random matrix theory captures some properties like spectra of Hamiltonians, but not others. I mean, if you think about that, it's crazy. Yeah. You, random matrix theory captures local a spectra of local many body Hamiltonians. And that's just a property of a, of a uniform random matrix theory. If you think about that, it's a, 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 a matrix that's completely structureless that captures the spectrum of a local Hamiltonian. But there's one detail missing. It's not local. The locality is completely ignored and the spectrum is still right. I had a conversation with a, with a condensed matter person not long ago where I was asking about this. Oh, but you know, there's a two by two matrix. So, wait, there's a locality. No, no, it's the same. So, Oh wait, you're right. The locality is missing. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, it's kind of crazy. But um, so motivated by this and your lines of thought, we have been thinking a little bit in that direction. And you, we had a paper recently that you, actually that really builds on Nick's beautiful work on StatMag models. Actually, it, it's a an add-on to his models where we looked at say random matrix product states where we have a matrix product set and you draw ID random the the the, the 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 content of the tensors to prove stuff that you can't prove otherwise. And we do lots of things. For example, we can show that these guys would um, show exponentially strong equilibration properties if we start from a product under generic Hamiltonians. Of course, everybody believes this to be true, and even uh, for Norman wrote something about this in 1933 or something. Um, conjecturing this, but it can hardly be proven. So we had to prove that for um, if that for for uh, if you look at random matrix product state and you look at the evolution under um, a generic Hamiltonian, then you would get ex exponential equilibration, in the sense that the the, the variance would be well, there's a large deviation bound for the for the variance that you mostly get the the the, the time average um, setting. Why am I saying this? Ah, because our secret motivation was very similar to yours. Namely, that we wanted to kind of average out the non-universal stuff and see the, 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 the real thing. So we are playing around, uh, playing with, um, say, random SPT, like random symmetry protected topologically ordered states, where we have like a, a constraint and the rest is taken random. And the randomness kind of average, is averaged away and only the, the, the topological features remain. And we have a bit of progress on that on that front. Um, a, a paper that was almost done is one that takes random uh, match gate tensors in an ADS CFT, in an ADS tiling, 
and that's actually quite interesting. It's like one of these toy models of tens on the ten on networks for ADS CFT models. And you have a kind of negatively curved um, uh, space. You have a tiling, and you place um, tensors on the on, on the tiling, and they are match gate mm -hmm. tensors like free fermions, but they are randomly picked. And then we can actually get a continuum limit of that, and can get an integral a closed form expression of the state on, for the state on the boundary from a random picture. We we put. We, we, we joined force with Alex Altland, who's like an expert in this in these integrals. He's a, he's a magician, and we got to get an expression for an, an effectively interacting theory on the boundary, which is critical. And there's a tens another picture of that. Why am I saying this? Well, I'm cheating. It's not the time dependent version, but it's a setting in which we look at a at a random a, a structural random tensor setting where we kind of average out the non universal stuff and keep the the universal features. So that's morally a bit in your mindset, although not not quite. But um, I'm aware of the question. It's like super interesting. We should do something together about this. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jens, for the for this. So, so um, maybe just um, coming back briefly to something that Vijay said. Uh, you know, you, you, you said something about um, uh, that that was um, quite uh, evocative. You know, you said, well, there were these two quantities that increased linearly, you know, once the volume of the wormhole and the other is complexity. And of course, that doesn't mean that there are, yeah. you yeah. know, the <laughs> fact that there are many things that might increase linearly. Yeah. So, totally. uh, so, you know, that was, um, you know, that was the starting point for, for um, the work that uh, Adam Bulan, Bill Pepperman and I did, uh, you know, we were, we were sort of thinking, you know, come on, you know, just the fact that these are increasing linearly doesn't mean they are the same. So let's let's actually show that um, you know complexity behaves in different ways. And we started thinking about pseudo-random quantum states and said, well, you know, this would have implications about about this uh, about this thing. And and in fact, uh, uh, what we ended up showing is not just you know some some implications of pseudo-random. You know, the fact that you could embed pseudo-random states in in the CFT. For the complexity of the of the dictionary map, but we also ended up showing, to our surprise, that in fact whatever was dual to whatever operator was was dual to volume in the CFT, it had to be something like comp computational complexity. So, how do you how do you show that? How do you show uh, uh, whatever is dual to? Well, I don't know how to write down the volume operator. In the field, right, if I, right. No, but but we, we I would evaluate it and, and and try to prove your conjecture. Yeah, yeah. So so it was a com it was a complexity theoretic argument saying that uh, look because because uh, because we could write down pseudo random states that were you know that uh, um, that corresponded to the growth of the wormhole you know so so in other words we we, we said we, we can embed this sort of. Uh, um, uh, pseudo random uh, states that that mark time, you know, mark the mark the evolution in the in the CFT, and now um, uh, whatever operator you have that's that 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 tells you how long it took, you know, from looking at the pseudo random state, it must it must be keeping track of the computational complexity somehow because because a pseudo random state will not you know, will not reveal this information to you in any other way. So, so it was it was essentially saying, you know, that that uh, whatever it is, it has to be, you know, it 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 need not be exactly the the circuit complexity in terms of the number right. of gates required to do this, but it has to be some close variant of it. It it can't be very different. So, it came as a major surprise to us, and it was yet another case where where I think. Uh, 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 I'm back. Sorry, my computer crashed. I'm so sorry. Um, we we could. It was reasonably uh, short, but I'm sorry. And my computer crashed. I I got it back up. Uh, the last time I heard that was that um, no no um, I I I I, I uh, got it until the point when you talked about your own work on 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 the on the volume growth being like seemingly the same as complexity growth. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm yeah, yeah, so that, that's, uh, so Vijay was asking how- can I, can, I, can I ask for a clarification of that? Or rather, let me repeat back and make sure I understood. Because there's a point there that I don't completely understand. So suppose the states are pseudo-random as might be natural indeed, but thinking about these kinds of wormholes. 
Are you saying that, uh, uh, is there an argument that any object you compute in that state, any operator whose expectation value, let's say you compute in that state, which grows, whose expectation value grows linearly for an exponential time, has to be you know, basically some simple function of circuit complexity or some notion of complexity. Is that- well, is so, so basically, you know, basically we are saying, look, if you look at the state itself, it looks random. You know, it, you know, so if you have any, any simple operator of it, it really won't reveal to you how, you know, the, the, how long it's been evolving. But the wormhole has been evolved, you know, its volume is proportional to how long it's been evolving. So, so now you have, you know, it's like you have this, you have this disguise, you know, the state is, you know, has, is, uh, is disguised in some ways so that if you look at it from the outside and you don't penetrate the disguise, then any okay. sort of regular operator you, you, you compute. So, okay, so I think I understood. I, I think I understood, so I have a question com coming back. So I think what you said is because the state is pseudo-random, if you wanted to construct an object which would actually measure that time, if you like, in whichever way you want, or uh, since, since the beginning, then that object has to be very complex in its own right. Because you know, a simple operator would not distinguish between these things. But why does that? Uh, so, so, uh, but so, so uh, the point I'd like to get to. So that that seems very reasonable and you know, excellent as a statement. Um, uh, uh, but but my question is, why does that mean then that it computes complexity of the state? And, and what does that precisely mean? So I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm using the word complexity here without defining it in three different ways myself. So I'm just hoping you'd clarify uh, what, what, what the precise statement is there. Yeah, so, so it's, um, it's just saying, look, um, um, so, um, um, so, so, so what what we're saying is, is um, you know, you you would have thought that there are there are many other properties that um, you know that you could you could call on, which which might be growing linearly. Who who knows what else is is growing linearly, and we we're, we're sort of saying you know whatever property it is, it's not going to be an easy property. It's not it's not going to be okay. something natural and easy to compute. So at that point, what are you left with? It's you know it's got to grow linearly with the amount of time you you know it's been it's been uh, it's been evolving. You know what what else are you going to choose at that point? You know it's some it's something that has very high computational complexity. It's something impenetrable. You know it may as well be somewhere so, in computation. So the I, I fully agree that the object that one will have to compute has very high computational complexity. That seems clear for the reasons you explained. Uh, and Adam and and uh, and, uh, and Bill explained that that, that it has to. Uh, so I guess part of the reason I'm sort of pushing is because you know the sort of uh, the the sort of tradition I'm used to trying to do things in the ADS-CFT is if there's something on one side, it's a dictionary, the ADS-CFT correspondence. So I would very much like to state the dictionary elements. So there's a, this object on this side, it's this object on this side. So I think your arguments tell us that the object on this side, the CFT, has to be, be uh, uh, you know, it's not, it's not like you know, write down a little operator here and there. This is some computationally complex object you've got to write down. Um, it still seems to me that there may be, indeed, exponentially many objects of exponentially high complexity. Absolutely. And um, it's not immediately obvious which one of those objects I should pick. But, but, but hey, one of them is the one. Uh, can I say yeah. something? I mean, I always viewed the complexity equals volume hypothesis or whatever as, you know, uh, 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 more, more of an aspiration, right? I mean, you know, the, the, like uh, the, there's... Um, you know, the, first of all, there, there are different versions, even just of circuit complexity. You can allow right. in silica qubits. You cannot allow in silica qubits, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there seemed to be, there never seemed to be any principled way of choosing, you know, which circuit complexity is the one that should be dual to, to yes. volume, right? And so, so I always said, okay, well, you know, you want something on the CFT side, you know, on the boundary theory that behaves like an intrinsic clock that tells you how long your state has been evolving for, right? We can understand why various kinds of circuit complexity would do that job, right? And, you know, and, 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 that, and that seemed like the best stand-in that we can come up 
with for whatever complicated, hard to characterize thing, you know, actually does do that job. Right. And yeah, yeah. So now what BFV have added to the conversation is the further insight that like if your objection to circuit complexity was that it is too hard to compute, then that objection is now moot. OK, because ah. anything, any quantity on the CFT yes, side yes. that's going to do the job, yeah, is going to all be similarly hard to compute. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so okay. I, but, but, but I, but I would still stand by. Yeah, it doesn't have to be circuit complexety per se in the particular. It's not the hard to compute quantity. The people yeah, have chosen to define it. Yeah. You know, that yeah, could still just be a stand-in for some other thing. Exactly. Uh, you know, it was, that, that, it was sort of an yeah. Occam's razor thing, right? So, for somebody who does complexity theory, you know, was sort of saying, look, how, you know, why would you jump to something so extravagant right away? You know. You know, computational complexity is not something we think of as feelable or something that's that should be an observable in a physical sense. And so and you say this, well, yeah, any other candidate would have the same feature of yeah. being sure. not efficiently computed. But yeah. that, that, that brings the, the, the dream to rest of Vijay of having like this dictionary, actually, which I learned from you <laughs> in a way. You gave this wonderful talk once in Aspen, where you got but there was this big confusion about this dictionary, then you were pushed into giving an impromptu talk on this in the afternoon. And you just had two hours in the in the lunch break to prepare the talk, and then you were supposed to give an improper talk on the dictionary between the CFT side and the and the gravity side. So I learned much of the dictionary actually from you from this talk. But having said that, um, this kind of brings the dream to rest that there will be one quantity that would capture it, but there's just many other quantities as well that could be equally not efficient. So, so, so may, I, may, I, may I push back on that comment? Uh, because I'm going to hold out hope that there is a quantity. So I accept from uh, the original arguments and from BFV and all of these things that whatever object it is, it's computationally complex, right? So that doesn't, so that means that if I try to write it down on my piece of paper, uh, it ain't going to happen so easily, right? But that doesn't mean that there isn't a specific object. And the reason why you'd hope for one of some kind is because in these correspondences, you know, the volume is the volume, you know, there's a number there and there's some object that's supposed to track this number. So out of the many different computationally okay, complex yeah, yeah. objects, yeah. right? The assertion would be one of them has an expectation value that tracks this and that's the volume operator. So, you know, traditionally in things like the quantum theory of gravity, people used to try to write down stuff like the volume operator, right? It's, it's very interesting, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's this emergent space in which there's a thing that you wind up calling volume. And, you know, in the, in the CFT, there is no volume. There's no such thing. Right, so it's, but it's, then I have a question to you. Then I have a question to you, which is, I mean, you must be aware of all these kind of very concrete, like tens of network models of ADS CFT that capture some of the real thing. And I mean, yeah. in, in some way you can even get a, a CFT out that maybe is a CFT up to like some quasi periodic structure or something. Like what would these um, toy models for ADS CFT with a with a volume growth, what, what would they say about this question? Yeah, so, so, so you, uh, in this case, I think you're asking the wrong person because I don't think actually myself, I don't think that tensor network models capture those aspects of okay, the ADS fine. I care about. And I'm uh, in nobody case, else. Because, and for, 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 for a specific reason, for a specific reason, okay. for a specific reason. So there's a sense in which what tensor networks do is, uh, let's suppose that these in these cases, you know, the, the, the ADS space has a scale, right? The scale is the yeah. ADS scale. Yeah. And the ADS scale could be, you know, uh, uh, 500 light years, huge, huge, right? So when you write down the tensor network description of these spaces, each node in the tensor network is supposed to represent one ADS volume, right? A, a size, it can be enormous. So there's large parts of what we would conventionally call the volume of the space that are not included. On the other hand, I think, Jens, I think you are, what you're asking is it's a totally meaningful question that you could say, how many of these nodes are there, right? You could take each of these nodes in the tensor network. Yeah, yeah. And that would be like my approach of like a project yeah. question, yeah. Yeah, so, so okay, so, so I, I would draw partly what I said <laughs> and say, uh, and I haven't thought about it carefully enough, yeah. Good, so there's kind of, Three paper ideas already on the desk for tonight. That's great. <laughs> well, great. Uh, well, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Jens, for a great, uh, very stimulating talk. And uh, thanks yeah, it was a great to you, uh, guys. Nick and great Vijay for also a very, uh, you know, a, a really stimulating discussion. So. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. It was wonderful. Thanks, guys. That was really absolutely great.
And Thanks for it. Yes, yes, you. yes, we have to talk about compressive sensing. Yeah, anyway. yeah, no, 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 it's not my, my to-do list. Let's do this soon. That's right. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you, Jens. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye, guys.